Welcome, everyone, to episode 11 of Conversations with the Wind. I hope everyone is all right and spending their time wisely. Please be safe and creative out there. The song I just played is titled The White Eagle by Lilu and John. Lilu and John wrote this as a sequel to Free Woman, so the two are linked to each other. At the end of this episode, I will play Free Woman as a bookend to this exquisite introduction. You can find Lilu and John's music on their website at www.lilujohn.com and you spell Lilu, L-I-L-O-U. On this 11th episode, I wanted to express my gratitude to everyone in the audience, all my guests, and especially Donald Kent for their ongoing support, encouragement, and patience. You are what makes this worthwhile. Thank you. Before I begin, I would also like to mention that today Christians celebrate Pentecost, which is celebrated on the seventh Sunday after Easter Sunday, commemorating the day that the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples of Jesus. Tens of thousands of Hungarians make a pilgrimage every year to the town of Csikszentmihalyi in the land of the Székes in Transylvania. The most important creation of the pilgrimage church is the statue that represents the Virgin Mary, or the Bodogasson. In this episode, I would like to continue the ongoing series of nationalism and poetry with the title, Croatia and Poland. In this episode, my guests and I will discuss nationalism and poetry in Croatia and Poland. Going forward, I hope to expand this dialogue to include representation from as many regions of Europe as I can. Due to our different time zones, we had to pre-record the conversation segment, and Donald Kent dutifully represented your voice throughout our discussion. Our cultures have been forged by heroic glory, hardened by shattering defeat, and tempered with commitment. The story of our nations expresses deep emotion and tremendous beauty, and we must encourage our bravest sons to believe in defending our people no matter what the cost. 
In this episode, I would like to introduce you to a world with which you may not be familiar. Please listen to this conversation with an open mind, with the understanding that we must embrace the entirety of our collective experience and use this as a means to find strength in unity to forge a better future for our descendants. As the liberal world descends into atomization and materialist nihilism, where individuals are disconnected from their ancient continuity, we cannot discount the value of the component organic expressions of national identity. In an age where chaos seems to increasingly become the norm and where morality is as fluid as the sludge that accumulates at the bottom of the toxic tank, we must preserve these ancient connections to our nations as a means to find solutions for our future. Our forefathers have seen many faces of the devil and their deeds should give us strength, hope, and strategies for co combating evils we confront today. It is also my duty to share my thoughts on the 100th commemoration of the tragic dismemberment of the Kingdom of Hungary after the dictates of Trianon signed on June 4, 1920. There will be those who welcome this demise, there are those who mock this great nation, and there are those who don't care. To Hungarians, this remains a traumatic event and tragic epilogue to an ancient thousand-year-old legacy. In his great speech, The Struggle for a P Just Peace, which was flawlessly delivered, Count Albert Oponyi introduced it in French, Italian, and English, flawlessly. Count Oponyi was president of the Hungarian delegation to the Peace Conference at Paris. The Hungarian delegation arrived in Paris on January 7, 1920, where they were immediately interned at the Chateau de Madrid Hotel and held under house arrest. Counts Istvan Betlen and Pal Taleki were also a part of the Hungarian delegation that accompanied Count Oponyi. The Hungarian delegation could not participate in the conference that redefined their ancient nation and illustrious kingdom. The Hungarians were only allowed to present their case on January 16, 1920, after all peace negotiations had been concluded among the victors of World War I. This is when Count Oponyi delivered his famous 70-minute speech in defense of Hungary, the Hungarian Kingdom, and all Hungarians within the Carpathian Basin. The dictates of Trianon and the dismemberment of Hungary were a fait accompli, while the audience of victorious nations listened with awe at Count Oponyi's, Oponyi's great rhetorical ability, they exhibited little interest in his cause and appealed to their better nature. In spite of the delegation's best efforts, Hungary was destined to have those borders and peace settlement the victorious Antan powers demanded. The Hungarian delegation never had a chance. No one cared. After Count Oponyi concluded his speech, Lloyd George remarked, quote, You have been very eloquent, close quote. Oponyi replied, quote, If there was any eloquence at all, it was not mine, but it was eloquence of the facts, close quote. I wanted to share a reading of this historic speech by Count Oponyi, but it's sadly almost impossible to find the English text. When I finally found it, when I finally find it, I will share this eloquently presented appeal to reason and compassion that sadly fell on deaf ears. I would like to end this segment with a song titled Nerkuled, Without You, by the Hungarian band Ismerus Orzok. This translation is my tribute to this heart-wrenching song about nation and unity. The five million Hung Hungarians referenced in the song are those native ethnic Hungarians who had been torn away from their thousand-year-old motherland after the dictates of Trianon in 1920 and were forced to live outside Hungary's current borders. Over the past century, these native ethnic Hungarian communities had to suffer relentless discrimination and ethnic cleansing under numerous forms of government from <clears throat> dictatorship to democracy. Various degrees of discrimination continue to this day. The European Union, the United Nations, and other international agencies have remained silent in this matter and claim that this is a domestic issue, 
while simultaneously proclaiming human rights for invaders penetrating Europe's borders. No one hears their call except their Hungarian brothers and sisters who have not forgotten. Nélküled, without you, has become an unofficial anthem and a testament to how one simple song can unify a nation. I'd like to start with my translation of Without You, and then I'll uh, continue with the song. Without You There are many things that I would like to say, and after all those precious years, there is no time for delay. If I tell you how nice it is we're here, and like long-lost dear old friends, we think alike and declare it clear. Though you cannot grasp the significance until you've had grief to experience. No matter what happens, while we rise and as we fall, blood in our veins unites us all. Like a lonesome pine tree ripped and thunderstruck, like a pebble cast aside, like a withering tired brook. Like a wretched vagrant who silently implores Faith in folk, house, homeland, respite slowly foregoes. Though you cannot grasp the significance Until you've had grief to experience. No matter what happens, while we rise and as we fall, Blood in our veins unites us all. Like a fading flower torn off at the stem, Like five million Hungarians the rest of the world condemns. Like an abandoned seed that never will arise, if you don't protect us, we shall meet the same demise. Though you cannot grasp the significance until you've had grief to experience, no matter what happens while we rise and as we fall, blood in our veins unites us all. No matter what happens while we rise and as we fall, blood in our veins unites us all. Blood in our veins unites us all. Nem 
neked, hogy történjen bármi, amíg élünk, és meghalunk, mi egy vérből valók vagyunk. Hogy történjen bármi, amíg élünk, és meghalunk, mi egy vérből valók vagyunk. In this next segment, instead of poets in our sphere, I'm going to read several poems that exemplify the relationship between the Croats, the Poles, and the Hungarians. The first poem is about the centuries-old Hungarian-Polish -Pol friendship, and the poem To the Hungarians was written by Zbigniew Herbert, one of the best-known and most translated post-war Polish poets and essayists. This short poem is essentially a cry of solidarity of the Poles with the Hungarian freedom fighters of the Revolution of 1956, also encompassing rage and frustration over not being able to help them. Here is To the Hungarians. To the Hungarians, we stand on the border and hold out our arms. For our brothers, for you, we tie a great rope of air from a broken off cry, from the fists clenched, a bell is cast, a tongue silent on the lookout. Wounded stones plead, murdered water pleads. We stand on the border. We stand on the border. We stand on the border that is called reason, and we gaze into a fire, and we marvel at death. Miklos Zrinyi the Seventh, or Nikola Zrinsky the Seventh, is the embodiment of the warrior poet. He was this, he was the descendant of an ancient Croatian noble house with deep ties to the Hungarian aristocracy. Zrinyi was a highly distinguished military leader who waged numerous battles against the Ottoman invaders and helped defend Europe from the threat of further Ottoman conquest. At the city of Egad, he saved the Holy Roman Emperor Ferdinand III. As Ban of Croatia, Zrinyi was a great political leader as well. Zrinyi was also a man of letters and a polyglot who spoke Croatian, Hungarian, Italian, German, Ottoman Turkish, and Latin with equal ease. He maintained relationships with leading European intellectuals and wrote many letters in Latin and Hungarian, but is best known as a Hungarian poet. He was keenly aware of his Croatian and Hungarian heritage and treated both with deep respect. Zrinyi represents a shining example of the close relations between Croatians and Hungarians, especially at a time when Europe needed great men like him. To this day, Croatians and Hungarians alike highly respect this great hero and poet. The following poem by Zrinyi speaks for itself. I'm going to read it in Hungarian first and in English. The title of the poem is in English, Time and Fame. In Hungarian it's Azidu is Hörnév. I'm going to start with the Hungarian poem. Zrinyi Miklós, Azidu is Hörnév. Azidu szárnyon nyár, soha semmit nem vár, és foly, mint erős folyás. Visszá soha nem tér, mindent a földre vér, mindeneken hatalmas. Ő gazdag, szegényt, összveront egy szerint, nincs néki ellenállás. Csak egy van időtől, s az ő erejétől, aki békével marad. Nem fél kaszájától, nem sebes szárnyától, üdő rajta elolvad. Az tündöklő hírnév, mely dicsőségre rév, az mindenkor megmarad. Nem írom pennával, fekete téntával, de szabjám élivel, ellenség vérivel az én örök híremet. Befed ez a kék ég, ha nem fed koporsó, órám tiszteséges, csak légyen utolsó. Akár farkas, akár emészen megholló, mindenütt féljül ég, a föld lészen alsó. Time and Fame 
Time goes his winged way, for none will he delay, but bears away like a flood. Never will he return, but ruin and overturn, like an omnipotent god. Pauper and miser loathe, he disregards them both, by none may he be withstood. But one survives the hour, who lies beyond his power, whom he spares his fatal blow. Time's shears and no terrors bring, he braves the hastening wing, time melts before him like snow. One whose glittering name signals honor and fame will remain forever so. Not with quill do I write, nor ink as black as night, but my sword's bright blade in foe's blood is displayed, my imperishable fame. This blue sky let shroud me through grave be ungraven, my last a breath be honor, and in the breach proven, though my flesh be consumed by wolf or by raven, let earth be below me, and all above heaven. The next Polish hymn was composed somewhere between the 10th and 13th centuries. Polish knights sang it as an anthem before the Battle of Grunwald. Bogorodzia, or Bo Bogorodzika, I'm hoping I pronounce it properly, also accompanied the coronation ceremonies of the first Jagiellon kings and remains one of Poland's most sacred hymns. The title literally means, quote, the one that had given birth to God, close quote. I will first read the English translation and then I will play the hymn. Mother of God Virgin Mother of God, God famed Mary, ask thy son, our Lord, God named Mary, to have mercy upon us and hand it over to us, Kyrie eleison. Son of God, for thy Baptist's sake, hear the voices, fulfill the pleas we make. Listen to the prayer we say, for what we ask, give us today, life on earth, free of vice, after life. Paradise, Kyria Leison. In the next segment, I am honored to have Luca and Zbigniew to join us for this conversation. 
I'm also always honored to have Donald on for another episode to discuss yet another interesting topic. Luka is the co-host of the Slavosphere podcast and is a Croatian nationalist. Zbigniew is a Polish national Catholic commentator and essayist. Hello, gentlemen. It's great to have all of you on the show. Could each of you tell us a, uh, about, a bit about yourselves for those who may not be familiar with your work and background? Also, please let the audience know where they may be able to find you. Luca, let's start with you. Uh, my name is Luca. I'm a co-host of the Slavosphere. I'm a Croatian nationalist, uh, part of the uh, party of uh, Generation of Re Renewable. Uh, a small but new uh, party in Croatia, a kind of their positionist. And uh, people can find me on uh, on Twitter uh, at, uh, at CroatianNet, as in nationalist. Yeah, I know. All right. Uh, Thank anything else, Luca? Would you like to add anything else? No. No, okay. that's it. Um, Spigivniev, I hope I'm pronouncing your name properly. Yeah, uh, yeah, as, as, as pro yeah, very, very properly. Thanks. Yeah, well, I'm, uh, as you said, I'm just a, I'm, I'm just a Polish, Polish, uh, internet commentator, which, who, who also ha, uh, is like half act active in some, in some, uh, Polish politi political discussions and, uh, Polish Polish sociopolitics. People can uh, I I write some essays. I I hope my book will be will be published some in some, but it's just essays in Polish, so it's not of interest of none of you. <laughs> and uh, and uh, yes, uh, people can find me on Twitter by the by by, by the name. Uh, Zbigniew Oleśnicki in, in, in Polish, uh, I, 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 I can just say uh, uh, Z-O-L-E-S-N-I-C-K-I-1309. That's a Twitter handle. I suppose the, my, my name will be somewhere, so it would be easier to, to find for, for, for English for English speaking audience. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank, by the way, speaking of your essay, that's the whole idea. We'll get into this later in the conversation. But this is a part of the idea of Imperium Artists to take your essay translated into other languages to share this with everyone. But we'll we'll get into that later. And also, both of you, just to let you know, we're going to add your information and links when I uh, um, post this on Twitter and also when we upload it on BitChute. Donald, you got this. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me in this amazing gang of minds, these cool guys. It's so excellent to be in your company and to learn more about your culture. And I really, really want to thank Nullis for bridging the sort of Eastern and Central European, Western European, America, all of us together. We need more contact and more dialogue with uh, Central and Eastern Europeans. We, we've got to come together more. I feel as if, you know, maybe it was communism that kind of split our family apart. And it's really important that we get back together and start communicating. And I really feel, you know, a great deal of admiration for people in in uh, Central Europe for their nationalism. And I feel like you're kind of leaders in some sense for the rest of us in, in this movement that we're in. So it's just such a pleasure to be in your company. Very excited about our conversation today. And where can uh, the people find you, uh, Donald? Uh, one site, AmericanZarathustra.com, AmericanZarathustra.com. From there, you can link out to everything that I've got going on, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, uh, BitChute. I have several appearances on there as well, and you can donate to my site if you'd like to help me to continue to produce content for the movement. Thanks. Thank you very much, and very well said, Donald, with the... Uh idea of trying to bridge everything between the east and the west or the occident and the orient of the eurosphere mm -hmm. i think that's an important uh, goal for all of us it helps us understand each other a lot better mm -hmm. and it also might provide some interesting new ideas to move forward so i'd like to open up this segment with the general theme of nationalism and poetry and i'm going to kick off this conversation with the following questions which i'm going to read and we can come talk about this openly, but I'm going to just, to, for the sake of the audience, read all the questions in advance. First question is, how did nationalist slash patriotic poetry historically evolve in your country? 
Two, do you have any examples of pre-18th century nationalist patriotic poetry or literature? Do you both believe that national identity and patriotism existed before the 19th century? Three, how influential was religion, in your particular case Catholicism, in the development of your sense of nation and national identity? Four, who are the best known nationalists, patriotic poets in your country? Five, how popular is poetry in your country? Do people still, still read poems? Do you have any contemporary poets who are also nationalists or patriots? Six, do you have any poems you would like to read as an example of nationalist uh, po patriot uh, patriotic poetry? And then afterwards, we're going to touch upon the issue of, or the question of Imperium art. So we'll leave that as the uh, toward the end of this conversation. So let's kick it off with how did nationalist patriotic poetry historically evolve in your country? Begivniev, let's start with you if you'd be so kind. Sure, thank you, very, thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction and thanks Donald for all the all the nice nice uh, words about about our region. Uh, I, I also hope that we will be able to to interconnect with 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 people of va various various with various backgrounds and various various uh, histories and various. A particular identities to 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 preserve and to learn from each other. Indeed. Uh, right. So uh, basically, you know, uh, with uh, we, we 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 I suppose lit literature and culture and history are always interconnected because people people create art in cer in s particular circumstances. So, uh, po so I, I need to give a little touch of, of, of Polish history. Basically, Poland uh, Poland began as a as a country in uh, the 10th century. This is and uh, this is not, um, commonly uh, ascribed uh, to the year 966 when Poland were, were, when the baptism of Poland happened because the local the local prince just took to baptism and therefore he was recognized by the by the uh, more western european countries as a legitimate ruler and uh, he uh, he therefore he was he was able to to create a stable country and uh, poland was an independent country for the next 800 uh, 830 years until the, the 1795 and during this, uh, this more and at certain points we we were quite a big country. Like uh, we at at the at the big, um, because you have to understand because that's also important about our identity that we have a sort of a post-imperial identity in a sense because Poland for many centuries, uh, particularly after the 14th century when we created a union with Lithuania, we uh, we uh, were on par rivals with Moscow, who was also developing at the time, Grand Duke of Moscow. For all these, for like M Moscow and Poland were rivalizing for all the, all the land be between us. So what is today Ukraine, Belarus, uh, the, 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 what is today Lithuania, uh, Estonia, all, all this stuff. And... Uh, for and at a certain point, Poland was, uh, or, or what we would call the Poland Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, was quite big. We had uh, at our biggest stretch, we had uh, we had uh, a, mi a million square squared kilometers, and uh, and also at uh, at a certain point, we, we we were we were able to 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 control Moscow for two for two years, which was sort of a high point of of us being 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 powerful well then obviously uh, Ra moscow and evolved into russia and uh, gra gradually uh, started uh, winning the wars against us and then then uh, then uh, took our independence uh, with with germany and with with prussia and austria at the end of the 18th century but basically during these 800 uh, years when we when we were an uh, independent country uh, we had uh, we had um, we, we had normal comfy uh, circumstances f for development of our own culture and this was primarily um, 
well, in the Middle Ages, uh, written in Latin, but then in, as all things in in Europe were at the time, but uh, after after 14th, well, 15th, 16th century, you have uh, you, you you start to have uh, to have uh, things written written also in Polish. And uh, in the 16th century, you have the first, some some of the first also poems that are that are dealing simply with uh, with uh, problems of pa- patriotism. Well, be, be because uh, obviously at the time there was a lot of wars with different countries, and uh, uh, there were poems, for example, about warrior warriors and knights that were fighting for the for for the country for the king, etc. That you know, some sometimes died, sometimes had some uh, some uh, adventures, etc., etc. Like for example, we had uh, uh, and uh, we we had a poet com- called Mikolaj Semsarzyński, who Sarzyński, who uh, who wrote who wrote some some poets some, some poems about all that that can about the fate of you know a, a Polish a Polish people uh, fighting fighting wars Polish Polish warriors. And uh, we 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 uh, always had this uh, Latin inclination, which is also combined with with, with Catholicism. The, we, we were always uh, Polish Polish artists were often inspired by by uh, by uh, classic uh, sources. For example, what uh, uh, may be of interest, uh, Jan Kochanowski, which was one of our greatest poets of. Uh, uh, well, n- uh, before modernity, that is, that is uh, generally the uh, 16th century. Uh, he wrote, uh, mm, he wrote, uh, he wrote uh, poems about different stuff like family and uh, human life. Uh, but also, he wrote, uh, he wrote a, a poetic drama uh, that was called "The Rejection of the Greek Emissaries," that uh, deals with uh, deals with. Uh, uh, Trojan War, the, and uh, the 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 plot is uh, basically uh, the the Greeks coming into the, the Greek emissaries uh, coming into Troya and uh, asking for uh, Queen uh, Helene to be to be given back, and then the Trojans having discussions and uh, some of them being the reasonable. For uh, political actors who want to give her back for the sake of not having a war, and others are are uh, only thinking about themselves and just what. And Paris and his his father, the king, wants to wants to uh, keep Helena and therefore the war starts, which was sort of uh, believe created as a as a uh, parallel of how wise politicians should not bring destruction upon their own country. And well, maybe one more example of of uh, uh, poetry or uh, before before modernity, before eighteenth um, nineteenth century, I can bring up Vespasian Kochowski, who uh, um, perhaps one of the few uh, figures of Polish history that may be known for Western audiences, especially right wing Western audiences, maybe King Jan III Sobieski, King John King John Sobieski, would say in English. Who won the won the Vienna battle in 1683? He uh, he managed to rescue Vienna uh, with Polish army, Polish and Austrian army, uh, from the from the Ottoman Turks. And this is one of the, also one of the most famous uh, victories in Polish history that is very much celebrated and very much forms part of our identity. And Vespasian Kochowski also wrote a, he wrote a series of uh, psalms. Uh, it was called Psa, uh, Psal, uh, Psalmodia Polska. And uh, uh, the idea was to, uh, to, uh, to dig from, from uh, biblical inspiration. So he wrote psalms as psalms were written about, about King David in, in the Bible and King, King David's victories. But dealing with with uh, victories by King Sobieski, uh, the, and his greatest victory, uh, his greatest victory against the Turks in 1683, that brought a lot of glory to Poland and is a source of and was also a source of pride during the 
the the the more modern centuries when we were, when we weren't that that powerful and uh, basically then uh, so this is how i would answer the question about about uh, the uh, poetry dealing with uh, de dealing with your country uh, before modernity before before 18th century and then uh, when poland lost independence in in 1795 uh we have for for the next uh two centuries i'd say the central problem of poland and the central problem of all polish artists would be the question of independence because poland would not be independent for 120 years until the end of the first world war and then it would be independent for 20 years when we would have a second world war then it would be a communist country so also we would have a separate country but we would not be independent uh, we would be communist under the soviet union so during these 200 years which were obviously crucial in forming polish identity the question of your country was central because uh, the central problem of all polish people was the regaining of independence and then for these 20 years after the first world war of keeping independence but so and this is how uh, polish modern identity was formed around this question so all the and this is also one of the reasons why i think artists um, are quite important in poland are uh, in Polish play an important role in polish identity because uh, for during the whole of 19th century when various nations developed their, their, their identities we didn't have the the normal normal politicians uh, that would be uh, that would be able to you know conduct pol politics represent the polish nation uh, so artists uh, often played the role of uh, social authorities of people speaking for the polish people for the polish nation and this is something that has and also moral authorities people that would aspire to to be the leaders of the Polish independence struggle. And this is something that has stayed with us. Uh, for example, nowadays we also have, well, nowadays it's, it may be grotesque, but we also have this among Polish artists, you would also have this, uh, this uh, imperative to present themselves as, as social leaders, because this is the, the role of the artist as the social political leader, national leader, is something that, that has stayed with us. And basically, and in the 19th century, the, this is the, the crucial moment for for Polish poetry when we have the so-called Trzech uh, Wieszczy. So we, this is a Polish a Polish noun that you could translate as something between a bard and a prophet. The Wieszcz, so somebody who prophetizes, that is also an artist. And uh, this, these were three poets, uh, mainly Adam Mickiewicz who is probably the, the best known though still rarely known because who who reads who reads uh, uh central european poetry uh but uh he's like the, the biggest polish poet we would always always treat him as the polish Goethe or polish pushkin uh, who and he and the, the task of uh of him and his biggest rival uh, Juliusz Słowacki and also other 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 poets. The third Wieszcz would be Zygmunt Krasiński, and the, the, but he would be sort of a minor figure compared to Mickiewicz and Słowacki. And the, so the problems that they deal with in the poems, in the dramas, in the poetic dramas, uh, would be both human existence, like because they were all romantics, so they would also deal with with questions like unhappy love, etc., and the romantic stuff. But the problem of of Poland of fighting for Polish independence would always be, and encouraging Poles to fight for independence would always be primary. And it's, this is also something that you can see in uh, in uh, looking at the at the works of art how they evolved for example the most uh, the, the two most important uh, Mickiewicz's dramas are um, one is Pan Tadeusz so Mr Tadeusz is just a Polish name uh, is about uh, is about uh, well it's, it's not a drama it's it's an, it's an epoch uh, about uh, uh, epos uh, about uh, how life was uh, in traditional Poland, 
Poland. Uh, and uh, so this if, uh, the idea was to preserve these, uh, these image of how Poland was uh, uh in in more nice in more in nicer times and uh, to preserve this identity preserve preserve this heritage and it is also written written in a in a way so that it would be uh preserving polish culture polish uh, identity polish uh, polish way of expressing oneself and uh, but in in the second of his most important works of art, which is Jade, and this it would be called uh, in in per, in English, I, will, I suppose, the Four Fathers Eve, and uh, uh, it is formed of three parts, and the and basically you could say uh, that the that you have the central figure that starts out as a romantic figure of you know this unhappy lover who has committed suicide and now comes out as a ghost to uh, and the woman who has rejected him sees him and you know he uh, and you know uh, and uh, so this typically romantic figure and with uh, and gradually he evolves from this romantic figure and this is the basically the main theme of the of the drama uh, as a whole, uh, from this romantic uh, romantic figure, he evolves to a uh, to a fighter who wants to fight for Polish independence, who makes, uh, who symbolically changes his name, and uh, therefore starts a new life uh, as somebody whose task in life is to fight for Polish independence, mainly mainly against against Russia. Because Russia took most part of Poland and also the part of Poland from which Mitskevich was, simply, and uh, and uh, the, and uh, in the first, uh, firstly, his uh, this is also an important symbolism. He the, the main figure uh, uh, starts up as a as a rebel and he rebel against he rebels against God. The, the crucial scene is when he is about when he starts reproaching God for all the suffering that Poland has endured, and he is about to call uh, God the worst name that can be he, that, that he can be called that is the Tsar because you know the Russian Tsar is the embodiment of evil for Polish people at the time, and but he is uh, saved from from you know this blasphemy of calling God uh, the Tsar. And therefore, he and then in the last uh, in, in the last sequence of the drama, he he um, learns that he should be that he should not be a rebel against the whole world, a resentful uh, rebel against the whole world, but he should uh, but he should be uh, a wise fighter for Poland. And this is basically this uh, this romantic theme of. Uh, of transforming your weakness and transforming your anger, transforming your resentment against the the, the situation in which, in which Poland is, where Poland has no independence, Polish patriots are persecuted, Polish patriots are you know sent to jail, tortured, killed, or you know sent to Siberia and this sort of stuff. Uh, this suffering is the central the central. Mm, point of of reference for for all these poets and also for all of Polish modern identity, the sense of suffering and injustice that that is encountered and the and the will to overcome it to be able to to bring back your to, to survive and to bring back your own. Uh, your own independent uh, country to bring to 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 give uh, to to give your people what it deserves, so a country of its own. And this is so so this is uh, the central theme that that is uh, that dominates over all, all the works of these other of these other poets. I don't want to talk about t t too much, so 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 that you don't get bored. But but this this is the general the general idea, and this is something that also to a degree mm, uh, replicated itself in all the later. Uh, later poems and you you have uh, poets and you have uh, various various figures for example so some somehow quite colorful for example you have uh, you had Nor Norbert Buntrick uh, who was uh, who was a catholic priest and a poet 
who was uh, also active in the movement for Polish Silesia, Polish in Polish, which was obviously uh, uh, the Germans were trying to Germanize it, and we believe that this is our land, and uh, and so, so he was active in in some Catholic worker unions, and he thought about Germanization, and he did it both as a priest and as a poet, and uh, and this is uh, and this. Uh, idea of uh, and these, these other these other poets uh, sometimes they would self grandize themselves. For example, they would be, become uh, they would uh, they would uh, uh, believe they would go too far. They would become blasphemous when in regards to to Catholic teaching because they would believe that the suffering of Poland is the central is the central is, is to theme and the central. Uh, the, the, the central problem, and the, for the, they would go too far in in in, in that. And for example, you would have the, the the central idea of Mickiewicz would be that Poland is the Christ of nations, and this would be a way of dealing with uh, with uh, the suffering as Christ encountered an unjust suffering, but he uh, but he won eventually. Uh, uh, in the same way, Poland, uh, the, the sense of Poland, of, of the injustice that Poland is is encountering, is to is to persevere, survive, and win in the end. And this and this is also a very romantic idea, like you know the, the, the belief that in the end the good the good side will win. And this is something that, that Poles are generally very very much ingrained uh, with. We are very very much. In grade with this idea that in, that we are the morally just side, and we will, and in the end we deserve we, we deserve uh, uh, a recompensation for all the suffering that we have endured, and this is something that has replicated itself also under communism, uh, because you had uh, because you had a uh, this was also the the the, the theme from which all Polish poets, Polish artists would start when the, the, the rebellion against communism. They would, they would, they would uh, say that that we have a morally just side and we will persevere and in the end we will we will get the the outcome, the morally just outcome that that we uh, that we deserve. That is that is a free and independent. A free and independent Poland and all the oppressors, uh, but mainly Germans and the Russians, would and then the Soviets. But obviously, this is very much entangled with the Russians, although it's a very complicated topic. Uh, would go away, and we will win, and will we will win in the end. So this is and uh, under communism, you also had uh, had uh, these uh, these artists that were moral authorities, and on one hand. You had uh, you, you you had uh, very serious poets, and perhaps I will I will touch on it later on. Uh, we will come back to that when, when we will discuss po- poetry in modern days, uh, patriotic poetry in mo- modern days. Uh, the uh, the po- po- poets who would uh, be authorities for the fighting sides for the has rival rivaling sides of the anti-communist opposition, but we would also have, for example, sang poetry would be very popular and still is to a degree in in Poland uh, that that is uh, anti-communist, but its idea is at the same time to preserve your own national national heritage uh, and be and uh, your connection with uh, big Western classical Latin. Uh, heritage. Uh, so this is and this idea that this idea that also Poland is morally is morally bigger than our oppressors because we are the treasurers of this of this of this heritage and they are trying to 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 to, to take it away from us. So that's this is how I would answer. Sorry, I know I've talked uh, too long. <laughs> well, this was a wonderful summary, and uh, there's a lot of uh, information here to. Uh, Absorb, Donald. I'm hoping that you took notes because there's a lot of interesting comments here about Imperium art as well, which I, we will discuss later on. I definitely and did. <laughs> a lot of a lot of a lot of parallels. Indeed. Also, and 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 I also have to say that the the summary was was very good because it gives us a really good understanding 
of the Polish uh, condition, the Polish spirit, to understand exactly where they're coming from. And I also see a lot of parallels with Hungarian history. So it's it's very interesting for me to hear uh, this perspective. And, you know, let's let's go to Luca. And, and Luca, I think that it would make sense maybe if we did a similar summary all the way up to uh, the post, let's say we'll keep the post-communist uh, or the, uh, yeah, the post-communist uh, era separate. And then we'll basically, uh, if you could just give us a similar summary, I think that would be a great idea. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, well, uh, nationalist or patriotic poetry uh, evolved slowly uh, because, well, national identity, well, ethnic identity, it's not something that was uh, so important in the in the uh, early days of uh, 9th century or 10th century. Uh, but there were some sense of, of the ethnic identity. Um, so in our early documents that we are uh, that we know of Croatia, we hear about the Croatian people. We hear about the Croatian uh, name, name Croatia. So we hear about Dux Croatorum or Duke of Croatia. We hear um, the King of Croatia, uh, Dmitry Zvonimir. Uh, we hear about the Croatian people, and we know that they are, exist. We have our own language. We had uh, our own culture. So I guess the language is one of the primary uh, uh, identities that we had. That we that was part of the, uh, uh, I guess I, I guess rising ethnic identity. Because we had, uh, it was forced on us by the by the church, which you know, it, it was the main language back then, and that was Latin. So our first uh, uh, our first literature, our first poetry and and and, uh, and ro- uh, texts were on Latin. And we had, uh, and it was mostly influential from Italy, uh, from Italian side. Um, so we had uh, um, uh, uh, stories, uh, we had uh, uh, poems, love poems, and everything on Latin. Uh, it was uh, very much influential by Petrarca, for example, in the, the 16th century. And uh, so all, a lot of a lot of our uh, influence that we had on our poetry and our literature was usually from outside. Um, and uh, so I guess. Uh, one one uh, second main uh, identity that we had besides language that was religion. Um, uh, since we are on like the middle, we are uh, our borders split uh, the Eastern uh, Christians and Western Christians. So um, we had to decide. We had to decide uh, whether are we going to become Orthodox Christians or we're going to become uh, Catholic uh, Christians, uh, Western Christians, I guess, part of the Catholic Church, and we decided uh, to become Catholics, to be uh, be part of the Catholic Empire, uh, mostly uh, to be more closer to the Franks. Uh, so uh, uh, we are very religious people, uh, as everybody was at that time. Uh, so our literature and our poetry was also religious. Uh, so we had uh, translations of uh, of uh, 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 gospels of uh, different uh, apocryphal uh, apo- uh, gospels, uh, or we had uh, Christian stories throughout the history, and it was usually on on Latin. Uh, until the 16th century, when it became uh, 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 where the Croatian language became more uh, more stronger and it was uh, more used uh, as our, as our own. Um, so our our literature um, it always involved in the con- on the historical context. So we uh, we had our own kingdom until the 12th century, until some country, I don't know who, Gaius, <laughs> uh, so. con- con- conquered us. Uh, and we since then, we were always part of the others. 
we were always under the Hungarians, we were always under the Aust Austrians, uh, and we were always under the Serbs, or we were under the communists. We were never uh, on our own until in the 1990s. Uh, so there was always uh, a bit of a, a, a clash between cultures and languages and, and religions, and that was what formed our religion, uh, well, our identity, our ethnic identity. So, so for example, one of the uh, when the Turkish um, uh, when the Turks came uh, and came to our borders in the 16th century, it usually in 15th century, it usually all of our literature, uh, most of our literature was focused on the Turks. Um, and that's where our Christian identity comes from. We, we never had like this huge uh, animosity to go towards Hungarians or towards Austrians, we had bigger fish to fry, and that was the Turks. And what unites us against the Turks were Christianity. So we focused uh, our literature on the Christian literature and uh, the Christian uh, fight against uh, against the Turks. So one of our poets were uh, that is the uh, quite famous in, in the world and in Croatia, of course. And that is Marko Marulic or Marcus Marulus. Um, he uh, he wrote uh, uh, he wrote he wrote stories and and and, and poems uh, about about Turks. Um, so his uh, a famous one called Prayer Prayer Against the Turks, Molitva Suprotiva Turkom, and that is basically um, the story about the Turks, what they're doing and how to fight them. It's, 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 um, it's more like a, a Christian spirit against the Turks. Uh, then, of course, uh, he wrote a uh, Yudita, which was a religious app. Um, how, how, how do you, what would you <laughs> call it? Epic poetry. Thank you. Thank you, Google Translator. <laughs> um, uh, about, uh, about Yurita, but it's a biblical story about Yurita, but it was brought into the context of of the Turks and Christianity, in a way, right? So, so the the it's always uh, um, the, the 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 poetry and literature in the 16th century and uh, the 17th century uh, was always against the, the the Turks, and the focus was the Christianity and the Turks. So that's one theme that follows us throughout the history of, of Croatian poetry. The other theme was just basic, simple life of, of Croatians, uh, the class struggle, uh, the struggle of the poor, uh, of uh, people working at, at uh, people who works at fields and then simple lives and clashes between between the rich and the poor. Um, the other, another theme was love, and love is always a theme that is that is following us everywhere because it's something that is idealistic and it's something that it, it, it never dies. Um, that makes us men, that makes us human, and uh, it it is also present in in our literature throughout the history, not just uh, not just in one period. It was always always there it was just a difference of how you write it and uh, i guess influence from from the east or the west uh, helped helped us in uh, many different ways that we how we how we write those things but then um let me let me start with the um, so ethnic identity ethnic identity was strong ethnic identity was beginning to form in the 17th century like before that we had a sense of yes we are croatians yes we are different than hungarians and austrians and and, and uh venetians we are different than turks we have something that is unique to us but we didn't have like a, a specific way to to form it so in the 17th century it began it began um, as a lyric, a lyric movement, as a Slavic movement, trying to connect the Slavic people all around us because, well, 
we had similar language. So it was uh, it was trying to connect us uh, uh, with with similar language and trying to form a, a, ly a lyric identity. But from that a lyric movement came out the creation movement. And one guy that is very prevalent in the lyric movement was Ludovic Guy. Um, he wrote he wrote a he had like a, a, a newspaper called Danica Horvatska, Slovanska i Dalmatinska, which was basically Croatian, Slovenian, Slovenian and Dalmatian. Uh, Dalmatian was not really part of Croatia in a way, it was kind of separate way, but we had like the same culture, the same uh, language, so it was always put together. And that was the first way that it was uh uh the creation identity was kind of focused on where it, it started rising in a way as a stronger identity and our identity uh was always kind of against someone right because your identity that you are that you are forming your identity is always in contrast to somebody else so that's that's something that e. michael jones talks about and he's not wrong i guess so when it when it comes to for example United States you have uh, you have you know uh, it, it, before when you have ninety percent white you have the Irish the English the Danish the the Italians but when you contrast them to black people well then you have whites and blacks right so when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, Croatia you had the Hungarians above us the Austrians above us you had the Serbs on the east you have Turks on the south you have uh, Italians well Venetians on the on the west so it's something that we kind of formed our own identity uh, because we were different so the first kind of uh, idea of forming identity was illyric uh, illyric movement in the 16th in the 17th century so uh, from that on it it came about the creation identity we have examples of um, Ivan Gundulic he was in the 17th century and he was he was the one who talked about uh, creation liberty so he was the one who talked about the tyranny of of the uh, countries that were above us uh, which was Hungarians and Austrians. So his his uh, famous uh, uh, song that we still sing every uh, <clears throat> that we sing uh, well that we read every day uh, when we have inauguration of of our presidents or when we remember our uh, independence we we read the uh, hymn to liberty uh, to freedom uh, that was which will be read. Uh, uh, which is something that I hold really dear, and we will be read uh, in this uh, in this episode. But uh, Ivan Gundulic, he's a he's a he's a, an amazing amazing writer. Uh, so yeah, I, I mean the the story of a creation identity was not something that was brought in, like from the very beginning. It was something something that was growing, and uh, poetry and literature was something that was uh, making it happen. It was making it stronger. It was connecting people. People read the magazines. People read the books back then. Uh, it was something that that was that is for that was forming our identity. And huge amount of uh, these people who are writers um, were usually priests, theologians, or politicians. Um, so it, it was, I guess, it was changing things politically. And uh, so yeah, uh, that's I guess something that I can I can I can say. There's many many po uh, poets from Ivan Majunaric, uh, Petar Peradović, a very patriotic, uh, very patriotic uh, 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 writer. He was writing about uh, military, about uh, uh, about fighting, fighting against uh, the the Hungarians, the Austrians, the Turks on the south trying to have our own independence. Uh, Ante Starcher, which is one of them also, uh, in the in the 19th century, uh, there was a politician that was the only one back then who said, not with Pesta, not with Vienna, but on our own. So that's uh, 
uh, that that's also a writer that is very special uh, in our in our in our his poetic history. We call him the uh, the father of our homeland, Ante Starcevich. So many many poets. Uh, there is worth to mention that without them, our creation identity and and uh, creation and uh, history of our literature and poetry and our culture uh, would be poor without them. So I guess uh, uh, that's a a bit of a short and maybe not as organized as uh, uh, as our other guest, but uh, but it's 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 something that i i guess uh, uh, i like talking about but uh no thank you I, very I, much I, yeah. yeah go ahead i'm sorry yeah i'm, I'm not as uh, you know i i i have a bit of an add you know so i jump from one thing to other so yeah i'm i'm sorry but that's that's uh, that's that's about uh, that's about it about uh, our history of of literature and uh, patriotic uh, literature Thank you very much for this summary. And Donald, I think we have a lot of notes to take here. So before we get into our impressions of this, I just wanted to also say that it's a very interesting thing to see how Polish national identity evolved, how Croatian national identity evolved. And you see there is already a little bit of a difference between the two in terms of how they define it and how they feel that it has evolved over the centuries. With the Hungarians, there's also a different approach. Hungarians believe their identity has evolved pretty much from the beginning of their their arrival into Europe, because the moment the Hungarians arrived in Europe, they were already different than everyone else around them. So it's a very interesting situation in the sense that uh, Luca is absolutely right that there is an element to when you have to identify yourself vis-a-vis the other, then it becomes more profound. In other words, before you define yourself with regard to the other, it's a more I- organic kind of reality. You you know you're yeah. Polish, you know you're Croatian, you know you're Hungarian, but you don't define it formally because there's no reason to. And when you're faced with the other, that's when it really becomes more contextualized. For the Hungarians, it was a little bit different because the moment the Hungarians arrived in, into the Carpathian Basin, into Europe, they um, had to immediately define themselves against the other because the Hungarians were not Slavic, the Hungarians are not uh, Latin, and they're not Germanic. So it was a much different kind of uh, historic contextualization for the Hungarians. And just to give you an example, the Golden Bull of Hungary of 1222 already specifically defined the Hungarians as a people in a formal legal government administrated document. The Golden Bull is like the uh, Magna Carta of Hungary, and it was actually drafted just a few decades after the Magna Carta. So it's a very interesting uh, uh, way to see how these different countries evolved their specific and respective identities. And I just wanted to go to a few of the points here. But before we do that, I just wanted to ask Donald if you what were your impressions And we'll get into the Imperium art conversation later. I just wanted to focus specifically on what was discussed now. So what what were your impressions, Donald, of what our two illustrious guests have been talking about? Yeah, there's uh, I'll make it concise. There's quite a lot, but uh, a few things here. So obviously, I'm, I'm interested in what we can learn from their experiences and their identity, their their national ethos, their ethnic ethos. And how can we bring that into the dissident right, into Imperium art as a lesson to empower us and strengthen us and unify us? So obviously, um, I think in the case with Poland, the idea of Poland is the Christ of nations. What a powerful, powerful idea that is. And, And so I think that is something that, you know, for Christians in the white diaspora, this is something we should look to, and I think a, a kind of a model for the entire diaspora. So, you know, especially obviously for people, uh, you know, who are re- religious, there is the question of, well, how do we reach and unify with people who are not religious in in the white diaspora? So that that's gonna, I'm gonna leave that question out there. Something maybe we could get to another time. But I think what's what's beautiful about that idea is that it brings hope. And, you know, in, in our time and in the struggles that we're facing in the globalist crisis that we're facing, 
um, hope is something we, that's very rare and, and we desperately need. And so I think we can draw a lot of hope from this uh, this experience and this kind of ethos. So I, I find with um, with Luca and the, the Croatian experience, it's interesting too. Um, the idea of you know identifying oneself as not the other, and in this case the Turks, or I would I guess I would also say Islam. So you know this is something that I, I try to tell people in you know in sort of the Anglo sphere that you know Western Europe doesn't have. I think the same history of living on the border of Muslim nations and all the war and tragedy and brutality that they experienced. You know, maybe Spain could could speak to that a bit, for example. But um, it's something that's not kind of woven into our identities so much. And so I think that that's bad in the sense that, it, you know, we don't I don't know, we're, we're, we're too liberal, I think, of the idea of, uh, you know, Oh, everybody can just get along. We all can practice our own religions and everything will be a rainbow coalition of, of happy people. And that's not the nature of Islam. It's a, it's an ideology, you know, that, that's been crafted over centuries and has, you know, taken over a lot of countries. So this, I think, is a very interesting theme that we need to bring into Western Europe and, and North America is this idea of understanding these centuries of of war to maintain your identity and so this is what we're dealing with now but on a global scale there's no clear borders we're not riding on horseback you know this is we're in in the internet age it's very confusing i think for white people in the diaspora so i really really feel we need to listen to more of our brothers and sisters in central europe and may i may i uh, just add Sure. Uh, also, like um, the Croatia was was um, in the 16th century, the Turks were or at our borders, mm-hmm. and um, because of our placement and we where we are, mm. um, if we if we fail, if we fall, mm-hmm. they will conquer Vienna and Christendom yeah. will fall. And <laughs> so the Pope called us ante morale Christianitatis, which means. Um, uh, the wall of Christianity. Beautiful. Like, uh, um, so yeah, I I I, I agree with uh, with every sentiment. And when it comes to religion, you know, I always say like, let's focus on something that unites us and not divides us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I I would want to. Yes, go ahead. I'm sorry. Because in Poland, the idea that we are the anti-morale Christianity is also very present. So I suppose we. Uh, <laughs> We, we all, and you know, we, it's, it's so funny. In the first time in my, like, my whole life, I've been told that Poland is Antemurale Christianitas. And now we just happen to come and say that Croatia is Antemurale Christianitas. I don't know. Look, uh, uh, <laughs> first, uh, now, you know, I mean, the first time that I'm hearing that Poland is that, but uh, there's, yeah, there's yeah. a bunch of things. It's, it's, a, very it's that, a very good attitude. It's a very good attitude. Well, yeah. all, I can, all I can add to this is that uh, the Hungarians are the only ones for whom the bells toll at noon. <laughs> so I I just want to add that the siege of uh, Belgrade or uh, Nandor Fehervar is the Hungarian name for Belgrade. The the battle the battle of Belgrade Nandor Fehervar was a significant moment in history that a lot of people don't speak about. And I think my personal opinion is it's probably more important than the siege of Vienna. And uh, the Pope issued a decree whereby whenever you hear the church bells ringing for about 15 minutes at noon, that's in commemoration of that uh, siege. I, so, thought, I, I thought that was because of the battle at sea. What's, what's the name of the battle? Like uh, something Sigat on L? Sigatvar or which one? No, something on L. Uh, um, uh, 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 there's, there was a battle at sea where they fought against the Turks, the um, Croatian oh, I know region. Yeah, no, it's, it's about, it's, it, I mean, I'm 100% sure it's for the uh, Battle of uh, Nandor Fehervar, Belgrade. Okay. Yeah, I was also I was also 100% sure that Croatia was the <laughs> wall of Christendom. <laughs> but, uh, well, but you we, know, you can never be sure of that, you know. And uh, uh, it's it's funny because you know we we also had a lot of of wars with with the Turks mainly in the 17th century. Uh, the 17th century was generally a, a century of wars. 
for for us and uh, you know uh, with with, with Sobieski, you, uh, you, because before he became king, because our king was elected, he, uh, he was, uh, he was a military commander who won against the Turks, and therefore, mm-hmm. uh, you know, as 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 presidents, uh, as you know, general presidents in the U.S., he was elected king, and uh, as as a military commander, he was the only military commander in Poland to ever get elected king. Because he was so popular, because of because because uh, uh, because the previous king was very very weak weak, and he won he he lost against the Turks and he signed a treaty that formally made Poland uh, su- subjugated under under Turkey, and uh, he re- he uh, signed it, but the 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 sort of um, parliament didn't ratify it and instead collected taxes to send uh, General Sobieski to fight so that this treaty would not come into force. Yeah. And uh, so, 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 so uh, and when uh, when Sobieski did uh, did win, he got uh, he got a nice uh, he from the, the, the Pope he got a nice uh, uh, he got a nice uh, uh, rep- representation of. Uh, of the of Constantine of Constantine the Great in the fall the, the Roman Emperor who you know fought against fought a, a shield a shield with uh, yeah. with a representation of of Constantine the Great who obviously fought against the pagans and here uh, Sobieski f- f- fights for for Christianity. Yeah, it's so interesting. It's, uh, so I, I, you know, uh, obviously I'm laughing about the fact that we are, we have to share the, 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 the title. But, of yeah, yeah. But our <laughs> title was given by us by the Pope. <laughs> I well, know, yeah. I'm, I'm I mean, now I have to check when did our Antemurale Christianitas appear. Uh, maybe, maybe it is there at the same time and he was just giving it to people. <laughs> and you know, yeah, you're my favorite nation. Yeah, you're my favorite nation. Yeah. So guys, let's uh let's go to the next. Uh, although before I do that, I do have to mention that the Hungarian Ottoman Wars, and a lot of people don't realize this, actually started for Hungary, for the Kingdom of Hungary at least, started with uh, Louis the Great, Louis the First, the Anjou uh, King of Hungary, and that was in the early 14th century. So the Hungarians were essentially engaged in uh, fighting the Turks for about 150 years until Mohács, until they lost. So it wasn't like uh, there's a misconception, I think, in the West that the Hungarians essentially just lost one battle or maybe two battles against the Ottomans and then it just collapsed. Yeah. There was 150 years of wars and the Croatians were instrumental yeah. and the Poles were instrumental both in, in defending not only the Kingdom of Hungary because under King Louis, the Polish uh, Kingdom and the Croatian Kingdom were a part of that same uh, crown, which was a very unique kind of time in history. And I also sometimes like to uh, consider uh, the rule of Louis the Great as a proto V4, so to speak. Suffice it to say, um, what people don't really understand in the West is that these battles with the Ottomans are very, very long, centuries old. So there has to be a little bit of a contextualization here. Um, Now, getting back... Real fast, I I apologize. I just wanted to put that out that, you know this is it's still going on <laughs> oh yes yeah. having set like uh, ilan omar as a, a in the united states government for example is mind-blowing and disturbing beyond belief to have so much islam infiltrated into the west already is a is a massive failure of western europe and north america and i guess as i would also say australia new zealand we didn't listen to our brothers in central yeah. europe you yeah. know it's extremely important to get that across yeah and and again you know we can i, I don't want to go into the we could and maybe we should have a uh, conversation about this on a separate stream to contextualize these questions that are being raised in terms of nationalism and empire, in terms of uh, the, the experience with uh, communism and Marxism, the experience with the Islamic uh, uh, infiltration in, in uh, Southern and, and Central and Eastern Europe. So we, we have to put this into context, but maybe we'll, we'll leave that for another stream. Um, I just wanted to go to the next point here. Actually, before I do that, um, so I, I just wanted to recap and, and see if both of you agree with this uh, assumption. 
in my essay, in the Imperium Art essay, I speak about what I call an organic nationalism versus an imperial nationalism. And what I say there essentially is that organic nationalism is the awareness of being. It is basically understanding that I belong to this ethnos, I belong to this community, and in my view, if it wasn't officially formalized, like I mentioned with the Golden Bull in Hungary, it was still a tangible reality for anyone. So a Bavarian was a Bavarian a thousand years ago, a uh, Croatian was a Croatian a thousand years ago, a Pole was a Pole a thousand years ago. And so these, these identities are organic identities that have existed, and these are the foundations on which the later uh, um, contextualization of nationalism evolved. So we have to, I, I believe, put that into context. And then you have the contrast to that, which I call the imperial form of nationalism, which is kind of the, the Bismarck style, or even what they did in France, where you had various ethnic communities in one country, in France, uh, France's case, or you had the urge to convert the Holy Roman Empire into a German Empire. And to that, you could say that Bismarck's uh, words with blood and iron, to get this done with blood and iron, is is probably uh, emblematic of the imperial uh, nationalist approach, which is to create a, uh, a superstructure with its own symbolism and its own identity that is above the component national, organic national identities. Now, in the case of Germany or in France, it often led to the subjugation of the components. So, so this is an interesting topic we can discuss uh, again in, in another stream, but I thought it was worth mentioning because I did mention that in my uh, essay, the Imperium Art essay. Um, now, I just wanted to double check, see if we were covering everything here, if I'm missing anything. Yeah, I, before we go into asking anything, let's talk about post-communist poetry. So, in in and I'll ask you, Luca, if you could uh, approach this first. So, do people still read poems, and and is it still a popular genre in Croatia? And are there any contemporary poets who are nationalist or patriotic in in Croatia? Well, unfortunately, uh, we read about poems and, and poetry in school only and it's it's about our history and everything but none of it can really match in a way uh, especially when it comes to poetry um usually people like like reading uh, novels and uh and then stories and then those kind of things and not really poetry uh, we have lost that. The only way that you can express today poetry is basically through a song. And it's it's a shame in a way, but it's still, I guess, it's still living. And throughout, through the song, it's more remembered in a way, right? We have our own like kind of nationalistic uh, song and, and songs and, and, and songwriters. Um, that was something that formed us in the beginning of the 1990s like um well when we were fighting against the serbs while they were writing you know these kind of funny today it's funny but then it was like a call of for war songs right we were we were singing about uh, how we were here from the seventh century he were you know we have uh, identity, we have our culture. Everybody tried to erase us, but we were fighting back, right? Uh, uh, we had like um, a, a three, like a, the, the family was the center, the, the, the fate and the homeland. Those are three things that people today sing, like nationalist singers sing about. And that's the only kind of, poems that we see today unfortunately um and and poetry like the, the 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 newest one that i that i saw was basically about um about sex usually and and it's it's all about uh, this uh, kind of uh, kind of simple simple i uh, hedonistic kind of materialism yep um that's uh, it doesn't it doesn't have like this 
um, this this huge obsession of love, basically. Like, where, where is love? Mm-hmm. Baby, don't hurt me. But where? <laughs> but where? Is, <laughs> yeah. But where is love? Love uh, today in today's society, at least in my country, and and um, it's probably worse in the West. That love is now equivalent of uh, sex, uh, getting drunk, and and white night uh, one night stands, and uh, those are so called love songs. It's this, it's 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 a really shameful thing. Like um, we, there is no like this poetic way to express loves love mm-hmm. what love is and especially when we come when we come and when we talk about nationalism even today like uh, nationalism when we have poets uh, poems in our country uh, we usually when we talk about a certain situation that is happening in our country we usually go back we usually take the poems from our history and then just like uh, uh push them in like uh, to to this situation it helps yes we can you know we don't uh, forget our own history but nobody is daring to write something that is that would express the situation that we are that we are in in a poetic way mm-hmm. um and before anybody calls me out uh how why I'm not doing that I suck at that <laughs> I tried Uh, to write something, uh, even when I was in high school, to write some love love poems, like when we uh, read Petrarca, right? We tried to do something like that. Everybody in our class to write something similar. It's childish, so I I stopped doing that, and I don't know. Like I'm not I'm not gonna try. <laughs> But that's that's probably the reason. I mean that's. Uh, uh, so I, to, to conclude, uh, we don't have like this um, big or remembered or something that makes you feel, something that makes you think, something that makes you change the point of view or of how you see your environment or how you see the situation. We don't have those kind of poetry today, unfortunately, uh, not in Croatia, at least. So that's that's all that yeah, I can yeah. say. That's actually sadly uh, endemic to most of the Western world, most yeah. of the European uh, cultures today. I would say that you have in the Hungarian tradition, you have a lot of nostalgia with poets of the 19th and 20th century or even yes. 18th, 19th and 20th century. That is definitely constantly revisited. And it's actually become an art form in and of itself, where you have actors who focus on reading poetry. So you, I don't know if it's a uniquely Hungarian thing, but it's definitely very popular in Hungary, where you would have poets who specialize in reading poetry. Um, yes. As far and and so you have a lot of that. You have a lot of music that uses elements from poetry. And even in the early 20th century, you have a lot of Hungarian poetry. I would say that Hungarian poetry is still very much alive. I would go so far as to say maybe until latter half of the uh, of the 20th century. In the last 20 years, you do have it, but it's not as popular as it used to be. Although I have to say that in terms of nationalist poetry, there's quite a bit out there in, in the Hungarian uh, culture, even now. And so I've seen uh, poems written by Hungarians Uh, even in the last few years that are very nationalistic. So fortunately for Hungarians, there is still a vibrant culture with regard to poetry. But at the same time, I agree with you, Luca, that the predominant cultural influence, sadly, is a lot of it's mimicking the West in yes. in, in many, ma- many ways. Yeah. And so in the music and in the film. So there's a lot of that influence. And so it, it becomes very complicated Let's let's ask what the Polish uh, experience is in post 1990. All right. Uh, well, uh, hmm. I don't I don't want to sound uh, to, to sound I no, neither want to sound too optimistic nor too pessimistic. Basically, well, basically I, I would say that the dominant uh, the, the, the dominant culture is also as everywhere with uh, Western hedonistic gangrene in the sense that it's this imported on ma on mass by by over by over media over well, the mainstream media the 
the, the pop culture that comes that, that comes from the West, or the you know Netflix series, etc., etc. Mm, when it comes to poets, so, so, so when it comes to poetry per se, I would say that um, hmm, we do have some uh, some poets who still compose, but they are like patriotic poets, but they do not, but they ha have a hard time uh, g going out of the niche. So after, uh, because as I said before, during communism, uh, we had, uh, we, we had, uh, poetry was, was indeed, and culture generally was indeed very much active, very much formative uh, as a political point of reference. And uh, I think that in terms of poetry, the, perhaps the most important battle that uh, that started in the during communism and uh, went all the way into into independent post 1989 Poland was the battle between two poets. That is, on one side, Zbigniew Herbert, whose uh, whose uh, poem you 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 know, uh, Gaius, uh, and uh, and uh, Czesław Miłosz. And uh, this is uh, also, uh, you know, uh, emblematic. As I've said before, we in the 19th century we also had some big poets that would rivalize for the uh, to be the most important Polish poet that would also be the most important mor moral authority. And uh, on basically Her Herbert represented the more the more traditional patriotic uh, stream, and Miłosz would represent the more progressive. But anti-communist stream, and uh, and um, uh, so so Miłosz was uh, mm, was a, was a bit older. He was born in 1911, and uh, he started out as a lefty, and before the war he was he was already a young lefty poet. And then uh, after the war, uh, he uh, he first started as a diplomat in the communist government. But then after, but he he uh, but he uh, got disillusioned with communism pretty quick pretty quickly, and after in 1951 he using his uh, his diplomatic passport he escaped uh, to the to the West and denounced publicly denounced communism. This was the first this was the first uh, he was the first artist who was previously previously part of the communist movement the Soviet movement. In, the, in Eastern Europe, who publicly denounced communism at a press conference, etc., and he was from the start treated treated with uh, with well, not positively by 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 many of the people who were already anti-communist before. Obviously, they, they never were in the service of the communist government, but he was always but but he was uh, this moral authority for 60 years, I would say, more well, 50 years, 50 years. For this progressive liberal part of uh, of the uh, opposition, and uh, he was uh, and he was uh, a very intelligent man and uh, very he, he wrote a lot, also a lot of essays, and uh, he uh, while Her Herbert was uh, a bit a bit uh, younger, born 1924, and he stayed in Poland. He lived in Poland uh, until the 70s. And, but he all the time he, he he spent most of his time in Poland, and he was always this voice of uh, more patriotic, more um, uh, more uh, like because you know you have to understand that Herbert would would always represent this uh, point of view that uh, for example he would be very critical of Poland before the war of uh, as we call the Second Polish Republic from which which lasted from the first. The Second World War, he would say that it was that it was uh, right wing, that it was anti-Semitic, etc. But, but though he was he was not not a Jew himself, and uh, he would uh, and for example he would always be ironic towards this uh, this Polish romantic tradition of, for example, armed insurrections against the oppressors. And uh, they would initially they would be on good terms, on very good terms. They would be personal friends with Herbert, who was on the other hand very much ingrained into this uh, this uh, traditional Polish identity. Post Polish because Herbert war was from the east of Poland, from Lwów, which was taken away by the Soviets after the Second World War. So he was ingrained in this post-imperial 
identity of a great Poland going into the east and this very this very romantic uh, well not mean romantic but more morally traditionally inclined stream and he was fiercely anti-communist fiercely anti-communist for example the communists tried to uh, when he became when he became uh, more uh, known uh, communists the communists would try to 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 uh, to poison him but they didn't manage they for example they installed they, they because he was he was quite poor so he they offered him to they offered him a flat uh, so he would have a flat flat for himself and and the wife but they installed secret agents who would listen to 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 what to all the stuff he did in in his house and uh, he would be and herbert would be the voice of the uh, of this of this uh, traditional idea that Poland in need, in need to survive Poland has to keep uh, her moral obligations towards the past that is derived not only from the Polish past but also from the Latin past per Herbert would be very much into for example uh, antiquity into uh, Romans into the Greeks and he would believe that Poland, uh, that Poland is a co country that uh, that can uh, that can uh, embody these ideals, these uh, antique ideas. And uh, he, he wanted Poland to be such a country. And he would always be this voice that that would say that moral compromises with evil are always bad. That you cannot compromise with evil. And uh, uh, and he he got really. Well known, he was nominated for the Nobel Prize a lot, a lot, a lot of times uh, from the 60s. And as I said, they were friends with Miłosz. And it's also a great story. But uh, in 1969, they at a at a uh, well, they always had their political differences, but they were personal friends. And then uh, they had an argument uh, when they were drunk uh, about the uh, Warsaw Uprising of 1944. Because Herbert, because Herbert would be very pro-patriotic, let's say, and Miłosz would be, you know, uh, he would be always laughing about, you know, how oh, these Poles they are retrograde, and uh, and therefore they would Herbert would get really angry, and they they then they wouldn't talk for the next 30 years. Only a couple of months before Herbert died, Miłosz called him, and they reconciled via via telephone a few months before before Herbert before Herbert died. And uh, Miłosz got the Nobel Prize in 1980, and it was, uh, and it was because of that he, and because of the fact that Herbert was uh, nominated a lot, a lot of times, but he never got the Nobel Prize. And we know, for example, that the communist government did what it could to prevent him from getting the Nobel Prize. For example, they sent some fabricated, incriminated, uh, incriminating allegations about him to the Nobel, to the Nobel Committee. And, you know, uh, and after 1989, when generally the liberals uh, got into power, because, you know, you had these basically, of course, as I'm oversimplifying, but you had these two streams of uh, opposition, anti-communist opposition. You had this this liberal stream that believed that, that they were anti-communist but were but was progressive and believed that Poland should be as Western Europe, etc. And you had this more anti-communist and at the same time more traditional stream of the anti-communist opposition. And the and basically the idea of the main ideologue of the liberal camp was that uh, was that uh, after 1989, when communism uh, is over, we should now form an alliance with the liberal part of opposition with the uh, uh, communists who want also to become European socialists, who, you know, want to build a new democratic liberal European Poland here. And Miłosz would be the moral authority, the pillar of this, of this, uh, this uh, movement, while, while Herbert would be extremely critical of it. Herbert would say that that all these people are corrupt, rotten, that they are uh, putrid manipulators, that they, and uh, for example, in this last call when they reconciled before uh, before Herbert's death, uh, Miłosz also asked Herbert uh, if he could, for example, start also talking to to uh, this ideologue, Michnik, to the main ideologue of the liberal camp, and Herbert refused that he will never talk to him. 
even though he knows he will die soon. And, you know, even though he was a very celebrated poet who usually, you know, wrote about very sophisticated themes like, you know, the sense of human life and, uh, and you know, anti antiquity. Uh, after 1990, he was so fed up with, uh, with the post-communist reality that he would, you know, publish uh, political com comments in a newspaper. And uh, obviously, he, and, uh, the liberal camp would attack him fiercely, like they would say that he has, they would literally promote the idea that he is mentally insane, that he is an alcoholic, that he is ingrateful, and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, after Herbert died in 1998, and he is for the Polish um, wide right, he is generally treat, he, you know, he fits up perfectly this idea of, you know, unjustly treated hero, of, you know, the, 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 the one who never got the Nobel Prize, uh, you know, people who, you know, and the, because of that, people who, you know, who are not into poetry normally, but are just right-wing, anti-communist, they would know that, they would, you know, they would know that Herbert didn't go the Nobel Prize, and Miłosz got Nobel Prize, and this is unjust, and <laughs> they would have this, this basic sentiment that uh, which is very much uh, replic a replication of uh, of uh, of uh, sentiment from the times of 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 nineteenth century, which are which I've discussed before. Mm -hmm. That you know that we are unjustly treated, but we are morally right, and we must keep uh, keep our moral righteousness. But unfortunately, after Her Herbert died and me was died a few years later, we didn't have uh, we didn't have uh, any poet of this format who would continue his uh, his uh, his work so we have some we have some some uh, right wing or patriotic poets but neither of them is able to you know go into the wider public but for example herbert's herbert's poems are still quite popular so even it's now 22 years after he died but they are still relatively popular among the more right wing inclined audience but unfortunately, we don't have we don't have uh, we have some people who try, but we don't have people who would uh, come up and serve as this as this uh, moral uh, artist authority for the right wing. And uh, the other side does have because, for example, uh, a couple of months ago, uh, a, po a Polish progressive feminist got the Nobel Prize for her shit li literature and the, for the liberal camp would celebrate her as, you know, oh, now she's so great, etc. You know, you know she's, a, she's like a, a typical crazy feminist. And, uh, and you know, they would use it in the cultural war. So it's uh, oh, yeah. Not, yeah. not good, not terrible. You're absolutely correct. There's a lot of similarities to what happened in Hungary. The same thing with the liberal movement, how they uh, work together with the former communists and formed coalition. And it plagues us to this day. Suffice it to say, Hungarian poetry is still very vibrant. I would say that the the culture of poetry is still very vibrant in Hungary. It's very respected. People read poetry, even in the mainstream. We have a similar situation in the recent years. We have Hungarian nationalist patriotic poets, but they haven't had the ability, at least in the last 20 years, maybe 25 years, to really break through and provide that legitimacy. I'm going to be very careful by using the word legitimacy because I believe, at least in the recent decades, there's a lot of forced and artificial legitimacy that's being um, forced onto us by giving Nobel Prizes to people who actually don't deserve it. But through that, they're, they're basically using that as a weapon against us in the culture war. I would say that there are quite a few excellent poets out there, Hungarian poets, but they are, their voice isn't really heard as much and their prominence is definitely not as strong as it was in the past. Fortunately for the Hungarians, we had in the 20th century quite a few excellent poets. I can't say that we're starving for poetry, but still, we do need to have some kind of a renaissance of poetry, not just in, uh, in, in Central Europe, but I think throughout the uh, Western world, throughout Europe, throughout the United States. So in our biosphere, we really... Uh, and I'm not saying this because I'm a poet. I mean, I, I write poetry, but I believe that poetry does serve a very important purpose, uh, both to capture the spectrum of emotion 
and also to capture the voice of a generation. So I think that we need to find a way to uh, promote poetry. It doesn't have to be mine, but it, it should be just in general. And so I think that this is a good segue to the next uh, section of this conversation, which is re relating to the Imperium art concept. And I just wanted to make a few comments because I took some notes after listening to your uh, introductions. What I found very interesting was the role of the artist in culture and politics when they don't have any tangible political power, so that the artist becomes essentially the vehicle through which the people can express their their desires and their their emotions. And I think that this is a very important point for us that we can uh, consider, given the cons current situation that we're all in, in this culture war and also in this ethnic war. So that's one thing I wanted to mention. The other one was the warrior poet concept that I wrote in my essay. And I will share my essay uh, in the next week or so. So there's a concept of the warrior poet in my uh, essay, which is essentially a way to embrace the full emotional spectrum of everything that we're experiencing in our current time, but also incorporating the discipline and conviction of someone who's uh, ready to fight, but also understands that they need to have a moral uh, foundation in order to do that. So these were just some comments I wanted to add to that. And I also wanted to say that the idea of Imperium, and maybe I'll, I won't even say anything, I'll, I'll let Donald continue with the Imperium art conversation, and then maybe we'll ask the two of you to give us some of your impressions on what you know so far, at least, about uh, the concept of Imperium art, and also what you think would be interesting to incorporate in that. Donald, would you like to uh, continue with the Imperium art topic? Yeah, I, I guess I first want to say that I'm uh, again, I don't know if this is a, a smart question or not, but the idea that a poet or artist would have the moral authority to lead people out, you know, politically, that that is an extremely powerful concept. And I'm I'm trying to think of the poet that was the first leader of Poland. This is during the Reagan era. Uh, he had a big mustache. I, I I can see his face in my mind, but I I can't. And his name is. You mean uh, Valesa, right? Yeah, Valesa. Yeah. yeah. And um, it, I remember even at that time thinking, and I was just a little kid, but I was thinking, a poet. <laughs> you know, like how how does he, a poet become? He wasn't a poet. A, he wasn't a poet. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, he, you can correct me. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you're talking about Valencia, because I'm not sure, I will send his photo, so we will we would be sure uh, we would be sure we're talk we are talking about the same person. But uh, Valencia wasn't a poet. Valencia was uh, Valencia was uh, uh, first. He was uh, he was just a worker. He, he was oh. a worker in uh, in uh, in uh, factory of ships. So he was, he was, and definitely, and he's not a good figure, basically. But. Okay, I'm sorry to, to bring that up. No, no, to, no, uh, I, the concept that I'm trying to get across is right. the the artist as moral authority and leader. And I, I, it seems to me from this conversation that you're you're pointing that out that the such people exist in your sphere, in your in your history. And it's, you know, my, my, it's sparking a lot of ideas, obviously, because this is essentially, I think, at the core of Imperium art as well, is to be an art movement that rallies people, guides people, uh, teaches people, and represents people. And it, uh, and I mean, our people, you know, in the, the white diaspora, in the current globalist crisis. Uh, against white genocide and so that that's obviously a very very big topic and there's a just our crisis really is there's so much division among ourselves and this is something that we are constantly trying to figure out you know i'm i criticized the dissident right recently saying you know we're all just coming up with more and more sophisticated ways to critique society and each other why are we spending all our time and energy on on doing that? We should be constructive. If you can't, you know, find people that exactly agree with your specific policies or philosophy, then then don't worry about that. Find people who do, 
and get to work on producing something that that makes you know a change in our world so you know looking at the histories that you're talking about is very inspiring to me in that way so my question actually is do you think you know if if imperium art were to really rise up and become mainstream um would that would that rally the people in the West in the same way? When I say the West, I mean you know North America and Western Europe. What what are your thoughts on that? Uh, Luca, would you uh, like to address that? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, well, um, art is something that uh, I, I I'm a kind of Aristotle. Uh, I like Aristotle. And uh, his point of view of art was that it, it has to be cathartic, like it has to change a man. It has to um, create a, a new way of thinking and, um, and, and basically destroy the last one, the, the, the previous one that you had. That, so you can always evolve into a better person. And so Imperial Art, so my understanding is, uh, should be to create better men, like men who cherish those things that have been lost or they are they are they are being attacked. And artists are and are and should be leading role of that. Now, like artists as leaders and and uh, of of a movement or something like that. I'm I'm not. It, it, it doesn't matter to me. Like it doesn't matter who the guy is. Um, is if he loves the nation, if he loves what he's doing, and he has the power and will to do what is necessary to lead the movement, uh, then fine. So I mean, I'll I'll be for it. But the situation is when it comes to when it comes to art, my uh, when the movement so divided, art is something that unites people um we we art is not just poetry it's not just uh, mm -hmm. uh literature art is everything like from from a, a a painting from a sculpture uh and in today's society i mean memes are art in in, in a certain way like i'm not not in the same value system of course but it's it's a it's a way it's a way it's a way that we push a message in a way in a way that we make people think about what is happening a way that um, that we awaken people i know m my awakening was not uh was not first it was like my introduction to, to a lot of uh our our stuff was through memes through short videos through music i mean it's a very it's a very shameful way what i mean it's it's a it's a fortunate that what happened to byron de la vandal he was he was one of the biggest like influencer in in and i guess getting this feeling of what what we are doing is fighting it, it's good what we are fighting for that it's good so i guess like when we talk about politics, when we talk about political ideas, it gives us a rational feeling, uh, a rational idea of what we are doing is correct, that it is a right, that we have the right to do, uh, to fight for our people, that is logical. But what we, but the art is the one that gives us feeling, that it gives us a purpose, a hope mm -hmm. to fight for it. So. My wish, I guess, uh, uh, is that Imperium Art uh, connects us all to give a, a bigger feeling uh, uh, to change us into a, a better warriors, more hopeful, and um, I guess believing in in that we are on the right side of history gives us very um, a, a very strong will to carry on. So that's, I guess, Thank my. You. That's very powerful. I appreciate that. And as an artist and creator in in this Imperium art, these are these are it's good advice for me. These are guideposts along the way. And one of the problems or not problems, but challenges that Nullis and I have come up with and Tyler in our discussions is the question of ethnicity versus race. 
So, for example, you know, North America, we use the term white where, you know, perhaps it should be European. But then there's the question of, okay, well, you know, Croatia, Italy, Ireland, Denmark, there's all these different ethnicities. So I'm feeling that I've come up with a solution to that problem, and that is to essentially find aspects or, or symbols rather that speak to us all and and this discussion has brought a lot of that up for me so religion obviously is a very massive topic in our history and it and it, it unifies a lot of us right um uh, my the the friend the enemy of my enemy is my friend you know people who have struggled against foreign invasion uh subversive tribes that are are have been finding their way into our cultures and hurting us in some way or another that that defines us also as other you know from them so all these things are coming together in my mind and in my art so I, I think we have a lot to look forward to, and I appreciate your joining this discussion. And um, Sabignia, would you like to uh, add anything to that? Uh, well, I think a lot of wise words have been said by, 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 by all of you. I, I generally uh, agree with Luca in the sense that in his, in his uh, making the distinction between, between uh, rational uh, rational political discussions and uh, and art as something that gives us purpose and gives us uh, and uh, unites people and I think this is uh, this is something that uh, all of us here we have touched on in in various various ways that basically art is uh, this is also something that that, that you guys uh, touched on in, in your essay that art is something uh, transcendent that this is something that uh, with art we we express ourselves in a way that is not possible by by uh, simple conversations by words so uh, so uh, the art is absolutely crucial to give human beings a sense of purpose and because of the fact that it is not uh, that you know uh, a work of art is not some someone's political comment. It is not a work of art is not something that we agree or disagree with in these simple terms, simplistic terms. But it is something that 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 we we can of course reject it. But if it's a good work of art, then it uh, it influences us and it can mean different things to different people. You know, sometimes even. People who have who create art can be surprised by by what uh, by what the viewers derive from the work, and this is uh, this is uh, I think uh, that this is absolutely crucial if we want to preserve any kind of civilization to have uh, to to have art as something that unites us and gives people a, both a sense of purpose on an individual level and a sense of uh, common uh, common unity of, of unity uh, on a on a on a interpersonal level on a, and, and sometimes unity that could not be that, that could not be simply put into into words but is understandable by a work of art I, I wanted to ask actually on this this question how either one of you could envision the evolution of Imperium art in your respective countries. So do you see a future for it? Do you see a context for it? And not just talking about Imperium art within your countries, but more specifically Imperium art with your relationship with other European Western, white, ethnicities, race, and culture. So how, how could you contextualize that? How do you see this evolve in your countries? Uh, Luca? I don't, I don't know, actually. I, I don't know how to phrase that. Um, will, will, would um, Imperium Art help us kind of unite with, with our brothers? I don't know. Like, um, art is not something that unites... I guess it's not that unites are someone who who has been an enemy of us. Mm -hmm. Like um, it, it's something that uh, 
it, it works for ourselves in a way. What unites us together was face is is and was facing a bigger threat. A threat, and I guess um, Imperium Art could basically like expose that threat. Right. That was something that that could that could uh, uh, bring people together. But I guess like uh, uh, placing creating some kind of a uh, um, place of of community of unity uh, uh even if if it's not like something that aspires to to connect uh countries and people from these countries but specific people like it, it doesn't have to be the whole country of croatia loving hungarians mm-hmm. or well i mean we, we love you guys but i mean loving <laughs> Ser- let's say the whole country of croatia loving serbs let's let's face it that way mm-hmm. um it's not going to happen, but uh, having one Croatian and one Serbian guy uniting uh, uh, against the enemy and, and exposing the enemy, uh, that is poetic. Right. And that is something that that uh, that could influence, like, not the whole country and not whole countries, but a big portion of, of, of the country, especially young people right. who are, you know... Uh, uh, quite bored with what is happening and and what is being used constantly. This brother war and uh, everything of that is being used against us, uh, against our interests. Yeah. So I guess Imperium Art, in that way, tr- tried to use a s- kind of a symbolism to connect what was broken, and um, uh, I guess fight against the enemy. And if I can, you know, say. Um, uh, to connect with the uh, uh, connect with the last uh, 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 I, I I cannot pronounce your name uh, <laughs> Donald no, no. Uh, oh, oh. Uh, the, the Polish guy you, you can just the Polish guy yes <laughs> yeah. if I can connect with the Polish guy yeah um, the beauty what's something that that brought me into the old right was the beauty of diversity in a way. Right, you have the diverse ideologies, diverse uh, 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 things of talent. Right, so uh, we have the ideological, rational back- backings, so that we know what we are fighting for. We have the humor, so we can laugh at the our, our enemies' faces. But we should have the art, so they give us purpose and willingness to fight. That's uh, uh, so. That's that's. I guess. Uh, it, it's it, it, the Imperium art basically to, to connect us in, in, in through symbology of unity. What is you know unite what is broken so we can laugh at our enemies. I don't know. <laughs> no, that's that's beautifully said. I mean, my I guess my question would be: um, Do you see that there would be some kind of resonance to this in Croatia? Possibly. Um, possibly. Maybe. I mean. In in right winger circles, like in my political in my in party in political party that I'm part of, yeah, I I believe so, yeah. Oh, wonderful. Okay, I mean yeah. it's we have to start somewhere, right? And and yeah. again, the the whole context, uh, the whole concept of uh, Imperium Art is still a work in progress. A lot of moving parts. We don't have everything, and and it's going to take a little while for it to evolve. And I think a lot of it will evolve naturally. And so I think that the most important takeaway for me right now is to know that there are there there there's an ear in Croatia that there's a, a an interest in this at least among perhaps maybe a niche circle of people but maybe more than we realize at least that's the hope. Uh, Donald, did you want to add anything to that? I'm just really inspired by this whole conversation. Um, you know, our guests are really amazing at putting these ideas very clearly and it's interesting because i think they are echoing the points that nullis and i have talked about many many times offline and so it it, it's interesting that there's just this organic understanding of all these things and then on, on as an aside it's really fun to watch you guys banter and joke around with each other (laughs) we we had we uh, when when uh gaius was uh uh, at my show, we we had uh, quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> just 
Just just for the audience's sake, I, I everybody knows me as Nullis, but I uh, yeah. had to put a first name there, so I chose Gaius. But yeah. just just so everybody knows, it's me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so Spigivnev, uh, right? See, I'm I'm practicing the name, so hopefully I yeah. I said it right again. Um, yeah. Would you? <laughs> I, I don't. I, the Polish names. Oh my God! No. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's gonna be worse. It's worse. I wanted to. No, I just wanted to ask if you uh, if you could also give us your impression on how you feel the evolution of Imperium art could evolve in your country and what kind of reception you might uh, we might experience perhaps uh, with this idea. Well, I think I generally I agree with 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 Luca in the sense that. Uh, in the sense that that well I uh, in the sense that we sh uh, of course people to unite need a threat but people also need some positive uh, purpose because mm -hmm. uh, if they only have a threat they uh, they because you know the the basic reality of people nowadays especially uh, the younger people the more it is true is that they are uprooted uh, atoms that they are more and more uh, spoiled by all the by all this liberal liberal ideology by all these uh, by all these uh, you know hedonism that is so so. Uh, worthless, so uh, uh, so empty, so hollow, and uh, and I think that uh, I think that uh, and as Lucas said before, uh, memes are art. Yes, I perfectly uh, I agree completely because you know art on a very art in a very like wide uh, wide sense of uh, uh, of the word is uh, something is is a uh, is a way uh, is an attempt to uh, to structuralize to understand uh, uh, the the world around you to you know to 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 understand anything out of the chaos that surrounds you and I think that even s that by using simple internet memes people are doing the same thing that was done by by songs. Or some poems, or books, or some uh, some other some other rituals, and these are some organic organic needs of human beings to have a higher purpose. Because people generally, if uh, because people nowadays are presented with uh, with absolutely nothing, they are presented only with the ability to be to be dumb consumers who just who, and their purpose in life is to buy new things and drink and have uh, and have one night stands and uh, this is absolutely hollow this is uh, this only makes people more sad more desperate more resentful more self-hating more resentful to, towards the larger world and uh, with art uh, you can uh, you can well, uh, you can catch uh, you can reach out to uh, to these uh, young individuals who uh, who feel that they who feel this lack of purpose and who suffer because of it who need some uh, some positive uh, some positive point of reference something that they could uh, look at as something worthy. And uh, something that they would like to contribute to. So I think that that by presenting people with uh, with uh, art, with culture that they can easily identify with, because it is culture and art made by people with whom they have something in common, then they c it, it it's it's an obvious way to to you know attach sense to your existence and it's something that every human being needs even if he or she doesn't think about it a lot he just simply needs something so some positive point of reference so so, so i think we we should all think in terms of you know reaching out reaching out to more and more individuals because generally people nowadays are uprooted individuals who need uh, 
who are sometimes in desperate need because, you know, people are in different situations. Some are in more desperate need, some in less desperate need of some purpose. And uh, giving them art is uh, is a way to to present them with something transcendent that transcends this uh, this hollow idea of their life as an as a as a consumption and buying things and sex. That's very well said. And um, Donald, I think we're going to uh, wrap this up uh, now. I just wanted to ask if you had any additional comments you wanted to add, uh, Donald. Well. These gentlemen are very good at expressing all these ideas, and I, I think that they've kind of taken all the words away. <laughs> they've done so good. So there's not Indeed. a lot more to say. I'm extremely impressed. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, and in English, too. So, I mean, I, you know, but um, the other thing is I just might kind of a very, very simple question is, you know, what do you think is the one thing that all people of European descent can relate on? What would be the root? Zbigniew, I'm sorry. Well, it's a complicated, it's a complicated question, you know, I suppose the, 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 the people can, can, can discuss it for hours, mm. but I think that uh, I think my, well, my basic my basic uh, idea would be that people that all people who want to find purpose in uh, in a uh, in larger community in a larger nation or whatever larger group of people with, with whom they have something in common, they I think that they should look into something organic for this people. And this is this is the say this is what uh, what what Nalus touched on. I think that you should uh, that everyone should look because you know the the attachment to your own people is something natural, something organic. So I think that everyone should simply if everyone simply looked into what is organic for them for their particular identity, uh, they would be it would be. be uh, and not, you know, try to construct some artificial, uh, I, uh, some artificial uh, identity, some artificial uh, things. Then points of reference, uh, it becomes much easier to, uh, to you know, to 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 to, to find yourself in in chaos. So, so I think that uh, everyone should uh, just look at, for example, the history of their of their ancestors. Uh, of uh, traditions that they can, that w w w with which they have something in common, and uh, mm -hmm. I think that's that's the most reasonable way to to, to approach Excellent. it. Yeah, I would Excellent. I would add to that that's sort of the idea of Imperium Art is where all these representations of the European bio spirit. So so all these these expressions that's where this existential plane in imperium art where these different experiences can congregate where they can help each other enrich each other where they can learn from each other and i think that through that experience through that exchange the common symbolism the common bonds evolve naturally and organically and i think that that's where you can find these these connections these synergies uh, Donald, I'm sorry, you wanted to say something? Oh, no, that's fine. I just wanted to give uh, Luca a chance. Oh, and, yes. And thank Luca for having a name that I can pronounce, too. <laughs> yes. that, that's uh, the that's, uh, beauty. Yeah, that, you know, my co-host is Paul, and he's Polish, and thank God, it's just Paul. It's not <laughs> <laughs> Which not, is I'm a beautiful sorry. name, by the way. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so... Um, was something that unites us all and and oh uh, thank god uh our polish guest uh uh, uh was talking because it, it gave me time to think about it because writing songs about white identity it's not something that is i mean europeans we europeans know i mean we are white but we are first and foremost our own ethnic uh, identity we are firstly creations then we are white right um so what, uh, talking about a white identity or white nation or 
creating some kind of a white super state, it's not really that is appealing to everybody, especially not Europeans. Um, but uh, one word just you know, kind of came to me, and that is brotherhood. Like um, brothers, brother, brothers fight, brother, brothers bicker. Mm-hmm. And 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 joke with each other and and have uh, uh, but they always unite when the family is in crisis. Indeed. And so I guess like um like I said before like focus on something that connects us and not what divides us. Right. And and so I guess brotherhood is a symbol that that is very connecting to everybody because throughout the history we always work together we always live together and we fought against each other and and like we we always we had we have history together mm-hmm. but when the crisis you know hit us we fought as brothers side by side right advice and uh, so I guess brotherhood is something that that could that, that that is something that could unite us in a way, right? We are different yet we are same, mm-hmm. uh, uh, similar, and you know we we have differences but we have something that unites us. Mm-hmm. So that's that's something I guess you know to think about. I, I'm not again I'm not uh, as you know uh, very a big expert on art. Well, it's an excellent but, advice. It doesn't it doesn't have to yeah, be. Yeah, but hard but uh, I I believe that it's it's something that is worth thinking about. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I think I think that we should we can end this conversation on the theme of brotherhood. And I wanted to thank my guests. I wanted to thank Donald uh, for constantly supporting my show. I think that that's a huge value. So thank you, Donald. Thank you, Luca. Thank you, Zbigniew. Uh, I'm trying. Yeah, <laughs> and, you, you did it fine, yes. <laughs> and so before we end this episode, um, would you gentlemen please be so kind to tell the audience where they may find each of you and your work? Uh, Luca? Uh, you can find me on uh, Creation uh, on Twitter, uh, at CreationNet uh, or Creation Idiot. Um, and you can find our work on Pinecast, uh, the Slavosphere. Uh, currently, I'm just waiting to pull. He's a bit of a trouble now, some kind of uh, health issues. So when he kind of recovers, uh, then uh, my episode with um, oh John Q. Publius will come out. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, because I, I, he was he was. Um, uh, he he thanked me uh, in his book, so that's the you know I I had to have him on. Absolutely, and and I was also on your show, so yeah. I highly strongly recommend the Slavosphere podcast. Uh, even yeah. if you go into old episodes, a lot of very interesting guests, a lot of good conversations. Yeah, and so I and strongly recommend yeah, the, that. Yeah, the Hungarian episode is is one of my favorite. One oh, of my thank favorite. you. Because it was it was fun and it was interesting. Yeah. Thank you, um, Zbigniew. Uh, would you be so kind to tell us where uh, everyone can find you? Well, everybody can find me on Twitter. As I've said, it's it's, it's again it's a Polish name uh, at uh, Z O L E S N I C K I one three eight nine. And uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I think that's the easy that's the easy way. Uh, yes, I, I was also on the on the Sabbathsphere in uh, last month in April. I discussed with Paul Polish politics and uh, some mo- modern pol- Polish politics. So if you are interested in that, we had I think five hours of of me talking about Polish politics. So 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 if you're interested in that, you you can check this out. Thank you very much. And uh, Donald, if you'd be so kind to share your uh, information again. Well, once again, AmericanZarathustra.com. That's that's a place to. It's like the hub of all my links to all the content I create: music, uh, art, video. Go check it out. Have fun. And so, before we end our conversation, Luca will read a very touching Croatian hymn titled "Hymna Slobodi." Afterwards, I will play the original Cro- uh, Croatian hymn. So I'll let uh, Luca read the hymn now. Oh, dearest. 
O sweetest, O beautiful liberty, gifts crowning all blessings Almighty God may be, true source of our every glory and victory, brilliant ornament jeweling our history. No silver, no gold, no men's lives, nor security can equal your priceless, your radiant purity. Well, I had a wonderful time speaking with all of you. Thank you again for sharing your time and your thoughts. As I said in the beginning of this episode, I would like to end with A Hundred Faces by Lilu and John. I've played this song on a previous episode and felt that it would provide an excellent compliment to their other song, The White Eagle. The White Eagle represents the Polish spirit and the Free Woman represents the Hungarian spirit. You can find the song on their website at www.lilujohn.com. Finally, I want, wanted to mention a tragic incident which recently occurred where two young teenage Hungarian boys were brutally knifed down 
and murdered by three gypsy thugs for defending their girlfriends while walking home from a night out with friends. In the past days, thousands of Hungarians took to the streets as a show of solidarity with the families of these young men. Two rival soccer ultra groups even called a truce on this day of mourning. This demonstration was also a show of force to send a message to gypsies who dare attack Hungarians. May their souls rest in peace. Thank you all for granting me your time and patience. It is through art that we can achieve the highest standards of decorum and elegance. It is through art that we can move and our brothers and sisters to finally awaken. It is through art that we are able to seek the face of God. I hope all of you and your families stay safe during these precarious times. Focus on what matters. Our people have been through worse, and we will always rise again. Our strength lies in our ability to love and respect each other. Our strength is defined by our ability to set aside our differences and fight alongside each other as sons and daughters of Europa. Have a good evening, everyone. We came from out of nothing to share when we were young From the streets of Shank is far off to Magadan We wished we had the wings to fly like the turtle bird And sing to all the Bolsheviks what they had never heard But I'm a free woman I was born a free woman I was born Shut